Okay. Uh, let me let me first say that I will be recording this this talk because this is about new media and teaching, and this is what I do in my classroom. I record all my talks and I post them at YouTube so students can watch them on YouTube. So let me first introduce myself. Uh, my name is my name is pronounced like a country. My name is pronounced Russia. It's like the country. I'm not from Russia. And I teach a couple of courses at EPS. I teach investments in the first semester. I teach now called asset pricing in derivatives, which used to be derivatives and continuous time processes and in the Master of Finance program. I also teach corporate finance and in MBA and in the executive MBA. And I also do some Educare project since the last year. We'll see whether it will continue this year or not. So let me start talking about the new media and how I started to get involved into this. But before I do that, let, let's ask the question, the standard question that every business should ask, what the customer wants. And before we can even answer this kind of question, we need to know who are our customers. So who are our customers? Well, what do they want? In every business, they fail because they do not give to their customers what they want. About a quarter of restaurants fail in the first year, and they usually fail because they do not serve good food, which is the primary function of restaurant. I mean, it is really the case that good restaurants prosper no matter what, whether they are dingy, expensive, noisy, it doesn't matter. As long as they serve good food, they do well. I mean, it is really difficult to, to come up with a restaurant that serves good food that failed. Now, who are our customers? Our customers are what is called Generation Y, millennials. They are actually at the right-hand side of the millennial distribution. They have been mainly born in 1994 to 1997, current generation. So what is, what, 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 what these students, I mean, these numbers are scary, I, I can imagine. So they have been born after the unification of Germany. They have no idea what, I mean, they know, they have heard about it, they have learned it from history, but they have not lived unification of Germany. If you talk to our students about the East and West Germany, for them East Germany is, you know, to the East, but not more than that. So they are number one, digital natives. What do I mean by that? Well, 99.8% of them owns a smartphone. They got their first smartphone when they were 13 years old. Started using Facebook when they were 12 years old, which is illegal, by the way. Facebook allows them to start using it when they were 13. On average, they started with 12. So what do these customers want? It's a difficult question. So let me, let me, let me tell you how I started and where it led me. I mean, I also didn't know. I explored this issue. I, I'm, I'm not of their generation, even though I fit into this generation Y. It's from 1977 to early 2000. But I, and I'm 1970, I was born in 1978. So in a sense, I'm kind of the same generation, but not really. I didn't got my first smartphone when I was 13 years old. So I first started by creating a website, which I was using for teaching purposes, in a sense. And I started it because, honestly, I had problems with CampusNet. I, I was teaching this investment course in four groups, and in order to upload material, I had to upload four times. If I send a message to everybody, some get them, some not, so I have to send it four times to four different groups. It was a mess. So I created my own website, and I started uploading all the course-related stuff to the website. So for each class, I would upload materials. Now here you will see PDFs of slides, you will see some Excel files, but you will also see an ebook, and you will also see video, video lectures posted on YouTube as well. This was just the beginning. Then I added a function, which I thought that it was important, which was discussion on the website. I thought, why would I answer the same question five times by email? If they ask the question on the website, I can answer it just once, and then everybody will know. So this is an example. How many of these questions do I answer? Where in this investment course with currently 200 and something students, I answer approximately uh, 800 questions during the semester. 
And nowadays, <laughs> well, depending what your goal is. If your goal is to satisfy the customer, then to answer. If your goal is to minimize the effort, then of course not. Of, of course, but will the customer? But isn't that good? But isn't that good? Well, I think it is. But that's we can we can argue on that. But let me let me continue. So, but I never answered the same question two times. If I let them ask the question by email, they would ask them many many times, same question, and then I would have to copy, search for email, search for answer. So I found this as a pretty convenient thing, and this was kind of engaging both for them and for me. Well, then I started recording these lectures, and I have to say I had a great support from Rolf and Anke to get the equipment, to set up everything, and it started really, really well. So I started recording lectures, and this is a recorded lecture. I don't do anything more than that. I enter to the classroom, and I record the lecture. And this is recorded together with the, together with the slideshow. I hope it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, so. What is the outcome? So every lecture is posted on YouTube. And how many people watch these YouTube videos? Well, you can see, you can check it. YouTube provides you the statistics. So the average is 68 unique full one and a half lectures videos per day. This is during the semester, out of the semesters. These peaks that you can see, these are exam times. <laughs> It is signed and it works, but it works for multiple purposes. It works for our students, but it works for other people as well. So it's not that only our students are watching these videos. Many other people from many other countries are watching these videos. So this is number of complete views per country. So more than 21,000 one and a half hour videos have been watched from within Germany. Everything else is from some other countries. And basically from all other countries, I guess statistics except from China because they are filtering access to YouTube, so it's difficult to measure. But I know that they are watching it because I get messages from students from China. So they are avoiding it somehow, but it looks like they are watching it from somewhere else. I don't know from where. Now, this is number of full video lecture views. I have cut out all that have been watching them for five minutes and then stopped. This is, this is in what it translates in terms of minutes. This is how minutes they have spent watching, watching these videos. This translates into more than four million minutes of watched YouTube videos. And each slide contains apps logo on it. So there is, I would say, a big advertising potential, a big advertising potential. For calculating? <laughs> I haven't heard, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, well, let me do it. Let me do it. Let me do it now. No, 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 no. I, ha I, have, the I have the slides. I have the slides, Richard. Wait. So, 70,000 hours of watched videos. How much would you have to pay for that if you have? rented an ad space on YouTube. You can calculate that. So, first interesting statistics. More than 60% of these hours have been watched from a mobile phone. This tells us how different this generation is. I would never watch YouTube videos on a mobile phone. They would watch it almost exclusively on a mobile phone. So I don't know, to be quite honest. It includes probably tablets as well. But tablets started recently. So tablets are not as popular as, as, as cell phones. Now, let's, let's try to estimate what's the. Can you identify the logo on the mobile phone when you watch it on the mobile It must be there, because I have put it on the yeah, slides. It's, there, but it's, not a small it's not so small picture. It's not so small picture. And actually, in the title of the video, it says apps. Yeah, okay. So. They cannot miss apps then. So what is the value of this in terms of money, as you are trying to say? What is the value of this? How much is it in dollars? This is the question. Well, 
If you want to advertise on YouTube, it costs you between 10 and 30 seconds per second per person. These are the current prices for, now, of course, it depends whether you are searching for health-related issues, finance-related issues, business school-related issues. Let's take the average value out of this, even though we are probably in the higher end because things related to finance and business schools are usually more expensive to advertise. Cost per click is higher. So multiply this and you get to this number. Of course, I'm totally aware that this number is an overstatement, because if I ask some school, do you want to buy it for this money, nobody will say yes. So this is, in a sense, overstatement. I, I'm totally aware of it, but it's one way to estimate. OK. Then, later, I have decided to create this ebook, And this is something that I will, just al at the end, I will, dis I will show you this, because I would have to stop the recording now and connect, it, connect an iPad to the projector and it would interrupt the recording of this talk. And I will demonstrate to you what this ebook is about. But before that, let's look at another statistic. 99.1% of them have a profile on one or more social networks. So everybody. Every student has a Facebook account or Twitter account or Instagram or whatever. Or most frequently, many of them together. 97.3% of them receive real-time push notifications from their social networks. So they do not check what happened on a social network. If somebody sends them a message, they immediately receive it. They get them in the real time. And now the question is why? Why would anybody do something like that? Why would anybody torture himself with the constant inflow of information. Somebody said this, somebody did that, somebody liked this picture, somebody whatever. Well, the answer that I like the most, which is probably not the only answer to this question, was given by one comedian, this C.K. Lewis guy. So C.K. Lewis guy said that this is a consequence of the primary fear of loneliness that he cannot think of any other explanation. Why would anybody do such a thing? You know, send Facebook messages while he is driving and, and endanger his own life and life of other people if it was not something really serious. And he said, this is primary fear of loneliness. We don't like to be alone as a human being. And this is, if you ask me why these networks are being called social networks. Because this social, in the social network, it's not like the social in the social institution. Okay, let me let me try to let me try to argue this. Let me try to argue and 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 show some examples why I really believe that this is this is the reason. So, but give me a few more slides. So, social in the no social network is not like social in the social system contributions. It's not for support of elderly, sick, or to whatever. It's social about so so socialization. Let's say it like that. Now, for them, this social has become a feature. They do not look at the social as, you know, as an entity. There is a social network, and this is a different entity. For them, social is a feature that everything should have. For them, social is something that is ever existing. They have started using it when they were 13. They don't remember the world before the social as a social network. So this is for them a feature. They expect every product. When they buy an iPhone, it's important for them that it has a social feature. Whatever they buy, when they buy a TV, they look whether it supports Twitter. So this is a feature. This is not something that is, you know, a different entity somewhere out there in the world. So then I started experimenting with, with Facebook and try, trying to engage students on Facebook. Let, let me also understand. So when we look at large cats, there are two kinds of large cats. There are cats like lions who live in groups, and there are cats like leopards who live on their own. So what you're saying here is what has changed in the last two generations is something comparable to there was a group there, the ordinary kind of leopard who live on their own. And now they gradually move or morph into a kind of leopards who live like lions in groups. Is that what you're saying? Social in that sense, that for them it's a kind of natural way of living? For them it's natural way of living to, to constantly be engaged with other people. 
Let's say it like that. This is their way of living. They constantly receive messages on their cell phones whether somebody pressed the like button on a picture that they have posted. So your position is that they do it constantly. They do it. All who do it every now and then. So they do it, A, constantly. B, for them, this is not a thing, the thing. This is a feature that everything should have, from a cell phone to a TV. They are buying TVs with Twitter support. So I started experimenting with the Facebook. So what did I do? I created the public page. So I have my own private one, and I have a public page for students, which is kind of free of material that they could use to blackmail me. And now let's see how, how, how apps is doing on Facebook. So this is apps number one with, num with the largest number of likes is apps business school Facebook page. If I missed some of the institutes or whatever, I didn't do it on purpose. I was searching and this is what I was able to find. So number one is the main page of apps, 4,965 likes. So 5,000 people said they like apps. App Symposium, 1.8 thousand. Number three, it's me. Maybe there is somebody else, I don't know, I haven't searched all the names. With 800 likes. Number four is some, uh, some group where they talk about renting, renting apartments and stuff. Number five are, is a gossip group, where they gossip. And number six that I found was apps from India, but maybe there are some other, I don't know. But now let's see what these numbers tell us. So if I was right, it shouldn't be like that. It shouldn't be that the number one is just an institution, because you don't join social networks in order to interact with institutions. Well, actually, this is the case. Now let's see why. This is a typical post on Apps Business School Facebook page. I don't even understand it because it's in German. I have no idea what it's saying. And I don't think it's that important. But what is important if you see this thing over here? Two people like this. Out of 5,000, two people have pressed like button. And I could bet that one of them is App Symposium and one of them is Stefan Smolnik. I could bet, because this is a rule. Now, let's see what happens when I post something on Facebook. I, as a person, I'm not an institution. I, with, with whom they want to socialize, in a sense. What happens? I post a video where my son learned how to swim. And it's a funny video because he starts swimming and after two minutes of swimming I have to enter up fully dressed to get him out because he starts drowning. 82 people, <laughs> 82 people press the like button. 82 people press the like button. Now, as a consequence, even though I have only 700 likes on my page, 800 likes, more than 5.5 thousand people have seen it because when they press the like button, all their friends are able to see that. So this is a network phenomenon. But let's do something comparable. You know, it's it's a crazy thing to compare. It's a crazy thing to compare something I don't know what and a funny video of a little kid almost drowning and me getting fully dressed into a swimming pool to rescue him. Let's observe, for example, the graduation ceremony. The graduation ceremony on a page who has been liked by 5.5 thousand people that has posted, uh, there is a number of pictures somewhere, I don't see it, I, uh, 59 photos, so 59 photos have been posted on the official page, it got 56, 57, 58, 59 likes. I posted one picture in real time from the core house. While I was in the core house, I took a photo and I posted it on my Facebook page. And I get 120 likes. And it's not only that I get 120 likes. People engage into discussion. There are no comments here. And they start commenting and we start discussing. It's about the social in the social network. It's not about the institu social institution that care takes care about I don't know, elderly or whatever, what that, whatever that social means. You can compare other things that are also comparable. So this is the, the, the previous one that I sh showed you with 56 likes. 
on, on the apps page. This is the post with largest number of likes on that page. There is no other post with more likes. So this is second best. Second best, 15 likes. Stefan Smolnik and 14 others. Well, a typical one would be like this on my page. 142 like this photo. I just, have po I just post a photo of a beautiful day at apps. I post a link so the Google rank of apps website would also jump up. Or you can use this also for educational purposes. You know, apps page is sometimes posting some interesting articles from which one can learn something. What is the outcome? Seven people like it, no discussion whatsoever. When I do the same thing, I post an interesting article, 30, 30 likes, and the discussion starts. I also post some funny personal things, like my son doing the Stratos jump and watching this Felix Baumgartner jumping. And I post also some educational things, like the relationship between number of Nobel Prizes and amount of consumed chocolate. Nobel. Amount of consumed chocolate and number of received Nobel Prizes per country. I mean, of course, this is just a, just a crazy correlation, but people, people, you know, learn something from it. And then again, discussions start. Many people like, there are many comments. I haven't, there are like three comments, one share, 59 likes. So we start discussion. There is a social component in the social network. Okay, let's move to other social networks in which digital natives are constantly present. Twitter. Some call it the most social out of all social networks because you basically post just small posts that cannot be longer than 140 characters. Let's see how, how was the situation there. This is the Harvard Business School. 66,000 followers. You might say this is impressive. Well, I tell you, it's not impressive because some totally unknown economist, at least to me, maybe he's super famous, I never heard of him. He has 215,000 followers. It cannot be that the whole Harvard Business School is producing less curious stuff than one guy that nobody ever heard of. It simply is difficult for something like that to, take, to happen. Where are we there? Now I'm posting also in no particular order. I saw Epps University, 900 followers. Epps Real Estate, 25. Uh, this Apps Institute, uh, 50 followers. Apps Symposium, 30. Apps Alumni, 172. 23rd Apps Symposium, 37. Remy, 284. Now, what are our competitors doing? Halt Business School. They invest millions in online marketing. When you are logged in into Facebook, their logo just pops out all around the place. They have Miserable 5,800 followers. How is our competition doing? Frankfurt School, 427 followers. KPNG Switzerland, just for a reference, 2,400 followers. Epps Universität, we saw it already, about 900 followers. Where am I there? 4,300 followers, approximately. It's a social thing. It's not for institutions, you know. I'm not blaming our, our, you know, people in charge of marketing or agency that is doing it for us. I don't know who is doing it. I don't know whether this is in-house or, or it's somebody outside. They simply cannot do it. You know, schools with much larger budgets for this thing cannot do it. They are not successful in it. You can spend as much money as you want on it. It won't work because this is a social network and this is not for institutions. You know. Apps Twitter page, apps Facebook page, they look like websites where somebody is posting news. Who cares about this thing? I mean, of course it's important and schools should have it, but this is not the social component in the social network. This is not how digital natives look at it. They look at it as a feature. They don't look at it as a website which they will visit. They look at likes, comments, and stuff like that. So. Is there something in it measurable for apps? Well, now, you can ask me what is, the, what is the point of this on the outcome of learning, because 
the point of this all ebook, website, YouTube videos and stuff, at the end, one should look at what the students learn. And this is very difficult to disentangle. It is very difficult to disentangle what was before and what is actually a consequence of these new concepts. I don't know, I cannot give you an answer. What I can tell you is that grades have increased, but this is not the measure. It's not the point of having higher grades. What is the measure? Well, how much more they learned. I can tell you that in this class, in investment class, I have took the exams from previous years and I have went through the examples what they have been asked to do. And I can tell you, simple net present value calculations, in both cases they were able to do it. Complex net present value calculations with perpetuities, constant growth perpetuities, infinite cash flow streams and stuff like that, most of them know how to do it in my class before they have, haven't been taught how to do it. They simply, it was not covered, it was not part of the curriculum. Then pricing of the bonds, 60% used to know how to do it, but they did it in a very wrong way. They were basically pricing bonds by discounting every coupon with the same rate, which is wrong. They should use the term structure of interest rate to discount bonds. Now, more than 95% of them does it correctly. When it comes to portfolio risk, they could calculate portfolio risk, 40% of them, if they had two companies in a portfolio. Now they can do it for N companies, 80% of them. Capital asset pricing model, noble price, the relationship between risk and return, the most important relationship in finance. They haven't heard about it in the previous, previous years. And now corrections of KPM as multi-factor models, I can tell you that 80% of them solves problems correctly. Now these are all measurable problems. These are, I ask them, calculate this or that. This is not where there is a space for interpretation whether you do it right or wrong. There is simply no, there is a correct and there is a wrong answer. It's simply as that. Either you do it properly or not. Now, what is the consequence of e-learning into this? I have no idea. But I simply, when I took over the course, I rejected to teach them net present value for 10 double sessions. I found it that, I f I found it that they will hate me if I do it. And I was warned not to increase the complexity. I was told, app students traditionally hate complex mathematically quantitative subjects. I was told they hate it, don't increase complexity. And the more complex I, I make it, the better grades I get, the better teaching evaluations I get. I think that this generation wants to be challenged. They need to be challenged. Now, you can ask me, okay, this is obviously a lot of work. This is obviously a lot of work. I have invested lots of, you will see the ebook, 30 hours of recorded videos, more than 300 pages with problems, interactive solutions and stuff like that. It's a lot of work. Why did I do it? Why do I do all this? <laughs> <laughs> I'm obviously joking, but this is one teaching evaluation. You, you can you can see this. You can see this. I have no intention of becoming a president, don't worry. <laughs> but, <laughs> but why I do it is actually to make the students happy. These are, these are the things that they write. Almost always they mention uh, YouTube videos. They, they love it. They love it. They love engagement on Facebook. They love different things. And not only our students. I mean, if you look at the YouTube and Facebook comments, I mean, I get emails, I get Facebook comments from our students, from other students. On YouTube, you can see, this is all open access, everybody can see that. I'm not, you know, picking up some that are good and leaving out the bad comments. Far away from them, I'm just randomly putting your stuff on the screen. Now, the question is, very, where will it go from now on? We have to be aware of one thing, that the world out there is getting even more like this. So every, each and every generation that we get will assume more about these social components, about digital learning, about iPads. When I created an iPad e-book, maybe two to three students in a classroom would have an iPad. Now, at least one third of them has an iPad or more. So where does it go? 
To demonstrate you this, let me, sh let me tell you one thing. One scary thing that I started to be aware of when a young cousin of mine became my Facebook friend. And this is that they start having Facebook relationships before they start having real life relationships. For the new generation, the generation that will come to apps at, let's say, two to three years, or even less. For them, you know, when you go to the website Facebook, you can select, are you married and to whom you are married, or are you in a re relationship? With whom are you in a relationship? Now, for them, for the digital natives, for the new generation of digital natives, these are two separate phenomena. They can have a real life relationship, and they can have a completely different person for a Facebook relationship. I was shocked when I learned that. This was something completely new for me. But this is how things do work. And this tells us that the world is changing in a very, very different place than it used to be. And these students have very, very different expectations on what they want and what we should give them. <laughs>